So thank you very much for coming here today. And uh, <coughs> I'll speak on this topic of inner change. So I was just about 10 days ago, I was in, was in Silicon Valley. And I spoke at Stanford on a similar topic. And uh, all of us have at some time or the other felt that we want to become a better person, a better student, better professional, better family member. We all have felt at some time or the other we want to change ourselves. Is there anyone who feels that the way I am right now is completely perfect? Yes, there is a lot right about us and there is also a lot that needs to be fixed. No. Broadly speaking, you could say there are two kinds of people in the world. Some people are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and it's not just that there are two kinds of people. We ourselves oscillate being, between being sometimes wise and sometimes what? Otherwise. otherwise. Sometimes we make a resolution. Maybe I'm going to be. I'm going to wake up early in the morning, I'm going to go more disciplined about my studies, about my spiritual practices, about my diet, about my exercise, whatever. We decide, I'm going to be a new me. And at that time, we have all kinds of good plans, good thoughts. And there's a new me for a few days. And after that, while the new me is not looking, the old me suddenly comes back. And we find that what's happened. Uh, I, last year, I had a, was invited to have a TV talk show on New Year resolutions. That time, I did some study. Around 90% of people's New Year resolutions are not new. <laughs> we made those resolutions in the previous year. And somehow, we couldn't uh, stick to them. And that's why in this New Year, we hope to be able to stick to them. So today's topic will be on this. We all want to, at some time or the other, feel that I should change myself for the better. But it seems that these efforts get sabotaged. So why does this happen? And what can we do about it? So I'll talk this in four parts. The whole talk will be centered on this diagram. So the world, the mind, the worldly objects, the sense objects. And then the process of bhakti yoga, the process of spirituality, which can empower us to transform ourselves. So when we do something which we decided I won't do, say I won't waste time surfing on the net, I won't waste hours and hours just chit chatting on social media. So many things we decide I won't do, but we do it. So why does that happen? We might say this is just, sometimes we might beat ourselves up saying that I have no willpower. But it's not as simple as that. If somebody says, if somebody says, I have no determination, I have no willpower. But actually, suppose somebody says sleeps a lot and doesn't wake up in the morning. Everybody wakes up, they keep sleeping. I have no determination to wake up. But that means you have determination to keep sleeping. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> if everybody is waking up and you are still asleep. So to do anything difficult requires determination. Now, the difficult thing might be something which attracts praise and appreciation, or sometimes it may attract uh, attract uh, condemnation. If you see somebody is addicted, even addiction requires determination. It's a perverse form of determination, but somebody who's addict, they they steal, they sometimes they will steal, rob, lie to get some money so that they can get uh, some a shot of drugs or a drink or whatever. So. Uh, one of my friends is a air, 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 air crew assistant and they were telling me that uh, even in the uh, airline, sometimes in the aircraft, people have such a craving to smoke that actually there are people who have trained themselves how to disable the smoke detector inside the air air airplane uh, restrooms. And they disable it and then they fix it also. They are so desperate to smoke. So it's not, nobody can say that I don't have determination. And actually say I have no willpower, it's, it's like a, it's a extremely unhelpful answer. Okay, if I don't have determination, what do I do then? 
I just don't have. No, we need to better understand why we do what we do. So let's look at the first point over here: the world's nature. See, the world often makes us uncomfortable. <coughs> Discomfort can come in various ways. Discomfort can come through overwork. It can come through stress. It can come through loneliness. It can come through, say, physical exhaustion or sickness, or it can come to worry about the future. So basically, we feel uncomfortable. And now, whenever we feel uncomfortable, as the word itself suggests, being uncomfortable is uncomfortable. So we don't want to be uncomfortable. And what do we do? We look for some relief. How can I get out of this discomfort? And more often than not, in the discomfort, we go towards some destructive behavior. So this is one trajectory from the discomfort to a destructive behavior. So I am very worried about my studies. What do I do? Okay, I, I, I so much tension, so much tension, so much tension. Okay, you know, maybe. I'll just take a drink, I'll feel a little cool. You take a drink to calm yourself, and then what happens? First the drinker takes the drink. Then the drink takes the drink. And then the drink takes the drinker. So we get carried away. So when we do some destructive, we act in a way that, that is harmful for ourselves. And then the person gets, a, just gets drunk, they can't do anything, <coughs> they have a headache. They, they have a hangover the next morning, they wake up and then they beat themselves. Why did I waste so much time? So what happened was there was a disc, this discomfort. And the discomfort, we responded to it in an unhealthy way. So it is not that necessarily that an alcohol was that attractive or that irresistible. It's possible. But it's not necessarily only that. Sometimes some people say, just spend so much time on social media. It could be not because social media is so attractive, it is because their real life is so lonely. And that loneliness is uncomfortable. So whenever we do something which we had resolved not to do, instead of beating ourselves up, we can think, okay, uh, what was it that I felt before this? Before I did this, what did I feel? And I thought, oh, I felt uncomfortable. And now what caused the discomfort? Now if we understand that, that can help us to create a checkpoint over there. See, the world will, all, <coughs> world will never stop making us uncomfortable. That is for sure. <coughs> there will be worry, there will be loneliness, there will be overwork there will be stress. These things will happen inevitably in the world. But when we want relief from it, if we default during the seeking of relief towards destructive behavior, then we will be entrapped. And unless we find a healthier way to gain relief from distress, beating ourselves up for having low willpower is not going to help us. And this is the first point. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is, I'll talk about this point, then I'll talk about the way we can address it in a normal way. Each point I'll talk about it, and after each point when I complete, I would like to have a short reflection or question if any of you have. So the class will be in four parts. First I'll talk about the world's nature, the mind's nature, the object's nature, then I'll talk about bhakti yoga, and then we can have final question answers. So this is the, <coughs> so now, now, if you understand that the world is going to make me uncomfortable, mm -hmm. then what do I do about it? With knowledge, first we'll talk with knowledge and then we'll talk about spirituality further. With knowledge, we need to understand that feeling uncomfortable is not unnatural. It may be unpleasant, but it is not unnatural. And the feeling of discomfort will come, it will stay for some time, it will go away. We don't need a knee-jerk reaction to it. 
the feeling of discomfort is like a wave. Now, when the wave comes, uh, the wave rises, 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 but it's not going to rise forever. Afterwards, it's going to come down. And if we just, instead of getting swept away by the wave, we just s go with the wave, observe the wave, rise the wave, it will go down. So, I was just 10, 15 days ago, I was in Hawaii. So, I was speaking about a similar concept and they said that that is what surfing is. Surfing a wave is, when the wave comes, you do not get swept away by it, but you, observe, you go with it, it rises and it comes down. <coughs> Another way to understand the discomfort is that when the discomfort comes, it is like an arm wrestling match. And this applies to everything that our mind does, but I will talk about it a little later. But say in an arm wrestling match, say the other person is very, seems to be very strong. It's pulled us almost down now. Now we are trying, almost down. I am lost now. How long can I hold on? I can't. I will give up. But if you understand that this is a timed arm wrestling match. So each round is 3 minutes. And if for 3 minutes we can hold on, then next time when we start, it will not be from here. The next round will start from neutral ground. The next round will start from neutral ground. So, uh, whenever we feel discomfort, we feel, oh, I am feeling lonely, I am feeling stressed, I am feeling overworked. This is how it is going to be forever now. How can I tolerate it? I will need some relief. No, it is not going to be like this forever. It is, it is a feeling which has come, it is real right now. But it is like a timed arm wrestling match. So, if you just understand that discomfort is not permanent, especially those high levels of discomfort which make us want escape at all cost, that discomfort will come, rise and it will go down. So, by understanding that discomfort is, is not unnatural. It is, it is unpleasant, but it is not unnatural. We can avoid letting the discomfort take us to destructive behavior. Let me just be with it. Just like say, another example to understand discomfort would be, say if you go, if you do some workout, you lift weights. Now, when we lift weights, it is uncomfortable. If somebody told you that for the rest of your life, you have to lift this weight, we will not pick it up only. But when we are doing exercise, we want to pick up the weight, but only for a short while. And that discomfort can actually increase our strength. So, discomfort is not, is <coughs> unpleasant, but it is not unnatural. It, it can be something which can strengthen us. So, this is the first point. Why do we go towards, why do we go towards destructive behavior? Because that destructive behavior is our escape way from discomfort. And if you could just become comfortable with being uncomfortable, yes, discomfort will come, but it is not going to be there forever. If you just become comfortable with being uncomfortable, we would not gravitate towards destructive behavior. So, any comments, any reflections, any questions? By reflections, I mean, say after you go in this class, this talk, a, what point would you like to carry with you? Somebody asks you, what did you hear? Something which you would might want to share with others. Anyone would like to share any reflections? Or if, yeah? Discomfort is natural, you have to be comfortable with it. Yeah, that's you a good. start from normal the next time. Right? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Discomfort is natural and is temporary. Yeah. We'll start from a normal level, not from the same discomfort level. Thank you, good point. Any other, yes? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so, when we say we have to bear the discomfort, does that mean we should just bear the situation or change the situation? That depends on time, place, circumstance. All that I am saying is that there's n the situation is not so desperate that we need an escape at all costs. Generally, when we go towards destructive behavior, we just don't think about the costs. This is so unbearable. And it's one simple level of discomfort could be boredom. I'm feeling bored right now. 
and then okay because i'm bored let me just surf on the net let me read this let me watch this and you watch one youtube video and there are 10 other suggestions and then you go <coughs> click one more click one more and then third i'll go for 5 minutes and it ends up 5 hours <coughs> <coughs> so yes now i'm feeling bored what do i do about it i can't just say let me be bored i have to do something about it but what we are saying is that there is a default behavior towards which we gravitate and that that boredom is not like a unbearable problem in life it's unpleasant but it's not unbearable so i don't have to just uh, uh, impulsively rush towards some uh, default behavior uh, now we need to deal with it and how to deal with it i'll talk in the fourth part but you we just don't have to gravitate towards a destructive behavior hmm? sometimes you might just tolerate it sometimes you might change it we'll discuss about that thank you anything else yeah um like i i thought two things were like one thing when you explained about how like even like addiction requires like determination and willpower uh i i was thinking like that's so true cuz i used to think that i didn't have willpower um like to do my homework and stuff but then when it would be like an hour before the assignment i would like be able to do it so fast and like get it completely done like like i thought i didn't have concentration but then i realized that like when i when i need to i really do so that means i definitely have it you know it's not like you don't have it um and then the other thing that i really like is just the fact that discomfort or like that feeling is temporary so like it, as bad as it gets it'll also be like it'll also go away except just right it like i yeah. really appreciate that thank you good so let's move on to the second point now so first is that the world keeps making us uncomfortable the second is so if you see the now i have put all these three in parallel but they are not necessarily parallel the the self is within us the mind is the first layer around us the world is the broad reality external to us and within that there are particular objects hmm, which we particularly attract us but what i am talking about is any of these can lead us to destructive behavior and sometimes all three may lead together also but for analysis we are understanding this in this way so the mind's deception what does it mean that pleasure often has a paradoxical nature most pleasures in the world that the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness we look at addiction as a extreme example and nobody is born from the mother's womb with a cigarette in their mouth many people may die with a cigarette in their mouth but nobody is born that way but what happens <coughs> nobody even thinks oh i am going to become an addict what they want looking for is pleasure mm-hmm. but there is nothing free in the world the mind's deception is it shows us only the pleasure not the price of the pleasure <coughs> the bhagavad gita talks about this in a very interesting way it says in 18.38 that there are certain pleasures which taste like nectar initially but they taste like poison afterwards so the mind's deception is so you could say that the pleasure is what comes before that is the nectar and then the poison is what comes afterwards but what we remember is the pleasure we forget the price we have to pay for it oh afterwards it's so feel so bad just like say if somebody drinks a lot and they feel high and after that the next morning such a painful hangover they have but next time when the opportunity to drink comes what do they remember the high they don't remember the hangover isn't it so the mind's memory is it has a memory I mean, we do re- the mind does remember but it's deceptive it remembers only the pleasure not the price of the pleasure it remembers so continuing the second point when the discomfort is there the dis- from the discomfort we get some relief by doing the destructive activity the mind remembers only the relief but after that whatever consequence is there it doesn't remember that now why is that <clears throat> because the mind is like a child and a child is usually too much in the present <coughs> now there is a common saying live 
live in the present. Be present. That's that's a common mindfulness principle. That's valid. And I have a whole presentation on this topic that live in the present, but not for the present. Okay, live in the present. You study right if you are experience life right now, but don't live for the present. You have to live for something bigger in life. Most of your students, you're not living for the present. You are living for your future. You are living for your career, for a bright life ahead. So what happens? The mind just sees only what is the immediate thing. The mind says, "Oh, this is uncomfortable. It's unbearable. This is enjoyable. Oh, let's go towards it." So the mind's deception makes us more and more vulnerable to destructive behavior. Because in general, if we knew the cost of something. Then we would be careful. Do I really want this? So suppose there's a big shop, big there's a big supermarket, and they say everything is on sale here, and the sale is hundred percent free. Really, you go and then grab as much as you want, and then you come back, and then. The next day you get a huge bill. Hey, but he said it was free. Yeah, it was. You didn't notice? It's free of all taxes. <laughs> and the price is still there. It's only no taxes. <laughs> so what happens is, if something appears free, we might just grab it. But if and this is the cost of this. Okay, then do I really need it? Is it really worth it? If we could see the cost, then we would that would act as a deterrent. But our mind doesn't show us the cost. It it shows us only the product. It shows only it doesn't show us the price. It shows us only the pleasure. And because of that, we tend to get deluded. And this happens with everything. Say we wake up in the morning, and the alarm which is rung, and the alarm rings. And then we wake up, and then what happens? The alarm rings, and the mind says, "Go to sleep. Just five minutes more, maybe ten minutes more." Now probably we we have many buttons. You know, we have our computers, we have our phones. Now probably the, one of the buttons that we use the most is the snooze button. <laughs> snooze, snooze. So what happens there is that the mind says, "Come on, just a little bit." At that time, now we may have something very important to do, but what the mind does is, just makes us forget that. Just sleep for some time. It's so comfortable. It's so pleasant. And then, say we have an important interview, we have an important assignment, and then we wake up. My God, this one hour I slept, I could have slept later also. But now, how am I going to complete this work? So at that time, the mind doesn't show us the the price. It shows us only the pleasure, <coughs> but the mind's deception is not only is not just this much. The mind's deception is even worse. Why is that? So suppose, say you are living a normal law-abiding life, and a friend comes to you and says, "I have a I have a plan to make quick money." Oh really? What is that? Let's rob a bank. So what? Says no 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 no. I have a foolproof plan. we can rob the bank and nobody will catch us and somehow that person is a very expert persuader and they persuade us and they say okay let's go and rob the bank and then we go with them and just as we are about to collect the money suddenly some alarm rings and his friends runs away and then we are caught by the police and the police take us to the jail and they bring us into the court and we are brought in front of the judge And we look at the judge, and that same friend is the judge now. How dare you, you may say? Now our mind is like this friend. The mind, when we are about to wake up, the mind says, "Go to sleep." And we wake up after instead of five minutes after one hour. You fool! How lazy you are! You are a hopeless, useless person. You will never improve. You are, you are gone. You are condemned. So the first mind makes us do wrong, and then beats us for doing wrong. 
And what happens? Because of this beating, we become discouraged. Yeah, I am good for nothing. So inside us, if you understand this mind is there, which is <coughs> by nature deceptive. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be deceived. But the mind by nature is deceptive. So if we consciously remind ourselves of the price, what do I mean by consciously remind ourselves of the price? That say if we, are, we have something very important to do, then maybe before sleeping just remind ourselves, this is what I have to do. Hmm. Or the one time when we are, we are fooled by the mind and we oversleep, then <coughs> what when we are feeling very angry with ourselves, instead of that just write down that experience and remind yourself of it. That time I overslept and this was such a stupid thing that happened because of that. And then if you read it again, and what will happen? That acts like a reminder for us. So with our intelligence, if we create reminders, so whatever is the destructive behavior, our mind props towards us. It comes at, comes up, come on, do this. Whatever the destructive behavior, the mind proposes, showing us only the pleasure, not the price. We consciously write down the price of this. <coughs> and then the mind may say, just let's, you know, just see, you get a notification on your phone, your friend has updated their Facebook profile picture. Oh, okay, let me see that. And you go and look at one picture, oh, let me see what other pictures are there. Look at other pictures, other pictures, other pictures, and then what happens? It's hours go away. I saw, uh, you could say a cartoon recently, it says that there's a person is thinking, person is saying, yesterday the internet went away, the internet went down, so I spent some time with my family members. They seem to be nice people. <laughs> so what happens is that we might get spend hours and hours like that, it starts with one thing. So when that has happened, instead of beating us, the mind says, you fool, you fool. Okay, no. Okay, what happened? Okay, this happened and then I wasted so much time, so let's just write it down. And if we write it down and keep it with us, what happens, Krishna says, use your intelligence to manage your mind. So we create reminders for ourselves. So the mind will always show us the pleasure, but with our intelligence, if we write down the price of that pleasure and we reread that regularly, then we won't get deceived. This was the second point I was going to make, that the mind uh, deceives us by showing us only the pr pleasure, not the price. And the solution to that is to use our intelligence to create reminders of the price. Okay. So any reflections or questions about this? And if this struck any chord with you, any experience, if you would like to share, that's also fine. Yeah, it's, 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 it's writing is, it's very simple and it's very powerful. Of course, the problem is that we, I, I, it has happened with me many times, I write it and I forget to read it. <laughs> so we have to keep it somewhere where it can be easily accessible. And it's good not to write too much. It's like some succinct points, you know, say, which, which can be elaborated later on. So I'm an author. So I need to research to write, but I, there's always a temptation that you can become an endless researcher and you don't write anything. So what I do is, to avoid that, I first get the skeleton. First get the skeleton of what I'm going to write and only after that do research. Sometimes you think, let me get the information first, then I'll put it in a structure and then I'll write. And that kind of writing, I found it doesn't work at all. It just takes an endless amount of time and nothing works. But instead, if you start it the other way, so what I do is, that <coughs> I remember, okay, if I start surfing on the net, okay, this happens, you know, I get, I, I waste my time, I lose my thread of thought, I get confused, <coughs> and eventually I become unproductive. So just made some, these four points, <coughs> and keep them as a, especially if you are doing work on the computer, keep them as a sticky, maybe put a hyperlink to each of this, where if, if you want to read more, okay, what exactly happens, how do I waste my time, put a hyperlink over there like that. But the idea is, we have to create reminders for ourselves. Thank you.
Anyone else? Any reflection or question? Yes, please. Okay. They know what the price is, and even if writing it down, because of the how powerful the pressure is. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. See, none of these need necessarily be a complete solution. It's these are all a series of weapons that we are acquiring, and it's not that necessarily one weapon will be the decisive weapon. But we just understanding. Okay, these are the options that I have. I'm not powerless. Now, which weapon works where? It's we don't know. So, to some extent, you know, changing ourselves is like uh, dealing with HIV. It's, it mutates, and that's why you can only restrain it. It's very difficult to cure it. So, it's it's not easy. I'm not saying that this is a formula that will. It's not, it's not a pat formula. It's a, but these are resources that we have. Okay. Thank you. And that brings us to the third point, your question. That third was what? The worldly sense objects. Now, this is an important point to understand that, <coughs> that the objects, every object has a gravity pull. Say, if I have the phone over here. Now, if I drop this phone, obviously I won't drop it. <laughs> but if I drop it, what would happen? It will fall down. Now, if I were in outer space and I dropped it, what would happen? It would not fall. Why is that? Because there is a gravity pull over here. And where there is no gravity pull, there is no, the object won't fall. So, similarly, between us and certain objects that we are attracted to, there is a gravity pull. And this, this is the important point, that this gravity pull is not the same for all people. The more somebody has indulged in that object, the gravity pull becomes stronger. Say for example, if there is a drug joint, where somebody is selling drugs, and this is the hostel of the student, this is the college. And there's two students who are passing by that. Now one of them has used drugs many times, has habituated to it, the other has never used drugs. Then both of them pass by this joint. What will happen? The first person, oh, let me take it. Let me buy. No, no, no. It's too expensive. I've got other things to do. No, I want it. No, I don't. So those thoughts will keep coming and going. But the other person, they may not even notice there's a drug joint over there. So if one has not indulged in a particular object, there might be no pull toward it. And for somebody who's indulged in it, <coughs> the pull might seem irresistible. <coughs> There's a British author Oscar Wilde, he said that giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I have done it over a thousand times. <laughs> so I gave it up, but it didn't give me up. Because when and I say I give it up, that means I decide I'm not going to do this. But I'm not taking into account the fact that there will be a gravity pull. And when the gravity pull comes, it requires conscious effort to resist. So, in general, if somebody has become very strongly addicted to something, then the, in that case, the gravity pull is so strong that it may seem almost impossible to resist it. Mm. So, first of all, we have to be understanding, understanding toward ourselves and understanding toward others, that the gravity pull is not the same for everyone. If somebody who has never taken drugs, says, why don't you take it, just give it up. Well, for you it's easy to say, for them it is not that easy to do. Because the gravity pull is there. So now, when the gravity pull comes, what do we do? First of all, we try as much as possible to keep, to not go within the gravity pull of those objects. To not go within the gravity pull. This is one practical solution. That means, say if, as I said, this is the staying place, the hostel, this is the college, and there is a drug joint over there. So don't go along this road. Even if it takes a little more time, go along some other road. Now, this is not always possible, but in many cases, this is a good step forward. I just gave a talk in Google in Silicon Valley, and Google did this experiment. 
and they had a problem of uh, employees taking a lot of candy and sweets and leading to obesity and a lot of associated problems. So they wanted to deal with it and they, they based on some psychology suggestions, they adopted a simple strategy that in their cafeteria, all the candy that was there, they covered it with, they, or they put it in non-transparent containers. Not with the containers having paper rolls advertising what is the content. No, just that people couldn't see it. And they did, did this for about uh, one year. And they found almost this, the consumption of candies decreased by 30 percent. So of course, you could say their cafeteria lost the profit. But in terms of the overall health insurance that they had to pay, they, they saved it. So this is not an ultimate solution, but this is one step. Generally, the gravity pull becomes stronger as we come closer. So if you can create some distance, the gravity pull will be lesser. Now distance can be, one is physical distance. But there can distance can be of different kinds. So for example, <coughs> if we create an obstacle, that means say either between the object and me, I can create a lot of distance or it may be close, but I create obstacle. And op what does obstacle mean? So suppose somebody has a capa has an inclination to spend a lot of time surfing on the net. Then just have some filter. Now, of course, if somebody wants, they can crack the filter and they can do other things. But usually what happens to us is that this gravity pull, although it is there, uh, the, the two differences between this gravity pull and the Earth's gravity pull. One is that the Earth's gravity pull is same for all objects. If you have the mass is same, the pull will be the same. But in the case of the, uh, for us, the gravity pull is different for each one of us depending on what kind of uh, actions we have done in the past. But secondly, going back to the earlier point of this arm wrestling, the gravity pull also is not constant all the time. It rises up, it peaks and then it comes down. So sometimes that, uh, that surge will last for a short while. And if in that time there is some obstacle between us and that object, then we will be able to resist it. But if there is no obstacle, then we will immediately succumb to it. So we could see what obstacle we could create. That is one way to deal with it. And most important is <coughs> that if we understand this urge is there. So even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. Even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. Persist means? Okay, when that urge comes up, I can't resist it. I know everything, I can't give it up. But okay, what, what am I doing in the remaining time? Am I simply beating myself up? Or am I doing something to strengthen myself? Am I doing something to nourish myself uh, intellectually, spiritually, making myself stronger? Then next time when the urge is going to come, I will be better, be better poised to resist it. So the even in for addiction, it is not that the craving is of the same intensity all the time. So we should not define ourselves by what we do when the surge comes. That is a very, we have to be aware of what we may do at that time, but we do not have to define ourselves by that. Our character will be formed a lot by what we do in between. So okay, in the time of the gravity pull, I will be overcome, but other times let me resist. Let me not just resist, let me work on myself. Let me make myself stronger. Let me find out things I can absorb myself in. That way, we can, we can be better equipped to resist uh, the gravity pull when it comes. So that is the third point. Any reflections or questions about this? Yeah. Like just being a member and like you know checking them, just checking them like now and then, that's also problematic, right? Because, so, so, so are you saying we should do that way of staying? No, I don't, I don't think that's practical. 
broadly how do we do with deal with social media actually i have a whole class on internet in the three modes it's like we have this you can have internet in goodness also you know for example if your phone is not working you just google the fault and there are so many help communities which tell okay you type over there so people help also it's just like neighbors might help each other so people you ask some question people answer so it's not that everything is bad on social media people can help also so we don't have to uh what should i say we don't have to denigrate it all we have to understand that the digital world is a reflection of the human world or an extension of the human world just as in the human world there are people in goodness who are thoughtful there are people in passion who are just always running around people who are in ignorance who are just uh, just sort of lose themselves in illusion so similarly there are people like that on online also so we the dif big difference between the re you could say the real world and the digital world is that switching from something in goodness to something in ignorance is super easy if i am in a library and i am studying and i want to go to a bar i have to cross a significant physical distance get up and go but i might be reading wikipedia maybe some serious article or some encyclopedia i'm doing some serious article for my studies and one switch and i can be you know, watching all sign of nonsense and uh, draining my consciousness drowning my consciousness in ignorance so switch is very easy but broadly speaking we can find all kinds uh, we we have the same humanity reflected over there mm. so i find three practices useful for myself as well as for others one is be purposeful that means before you go itself on social media or online have a plan what am i going to do be purposeful don't think that okay i'm bored let me see if i find something interesting over there be perf okay you know i have to look at i have to answer these emails i have to check this friends update hmm? be purposeful be time bound hmm? now this okay i'm going to spend 15 minutes on this hmm? and now sometimes something very interesting may come up and i say let me read it more but uh the third principle i use over here is <coughs> be uh be willing to postpone not postpone your real life work postpone your online work so what happens when something comes up online hey i want to read it right now i want to respond to it right now sometimes something might be very urgent and we have to do it that we may do but that is it's a, usually super urgent work we don't have to do it may take just finish it in a few minutes bigger work i want to read this i want to watch this just defer it for some time be ready to defer and what happens if you defer it okay this is interesting uh, but i'll see this tomorrow don't forget it but don't indulge in it right now so what happens if you just wait for one day then you get is it really that important because when we get see something new hey this looks interesting let me read it but if you just save the link if i want and then later so then <coughs> we can evaluate better so broadly we do this thing be purposeful what am i going to do here how long i am going to do this and if something extra is coming i'm not going to say no but i'll defer it by that we won't get carried away and then after that we plan okay this is this is interesting it's like a this is a one hour video okay let me plan when i'll see it so there a lot of interesting thing can also come up and if we just make it a rigid rule it won't work but if there's no rule also that won't work so i think this this framework helps okay thank you mm. so any any other points about this gravity pull okay yeah yes definitely yeah so the pull is like say for somebody who is from south india masala dosa may have a lot of pull for them <laughs> for somebody who is from punjab paratha might have a lot of pull <laughs> for somebody else it might be pizza or so many other items so based based on our culture our upbringing certain objects will have a greater pull on us so we have to be conscious of that which objects pull me more and then we can we can plan how to deal with it properly okay 
Yeah? Okay. I think I was going to ask, like, because sometimes I wonder between, well, actually, you already answered it, so I'll just say my question, but I was going to say, like, when do you know whether you should, like, just completely not engage in something or versus, like, engage responsibly, I guess? And social, you just gave your answer with social media, I feel like. You can't just, it's not very practical to just not use, like, social media entirely, but... So yeah, you basically explained it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, it's good. So that is, uh, what is it called? It's an IFO, nice word for it. The digital detox. <laughs> digital detox means you plan in advance that for the next one day, for one day, I'm not going to go online. And it's not as easy as it seems. The urge comes up, maybe something will come up, something will come up. So you, we could just do that as a means to exercise our willpower. Maybe not, not at a time when we are expecting some very important updates, but just plan it out. And okay, maybe one week in a month or one week in a fortnight, or not sorry, one day in a week, one, one day in a fortnight, one day in a month. Let me not uh, abstain from it. So we can try that and see how much, uh, how much, how it is benefits us. So we need to regulate it. I think eliminating it is quite difficult in today's world. We, we cannot, uh, we cannot change the way the world is around us. But what we can do is that we don't let the world determine who we are. We have to find a balance between the two. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let me move on to the last point now. That is, I, you can see here, there's the, the bar of Bhakti Yoga. Hmm? It's in between this. The self is here, the world is here, the objects are here, and the mind is here. But Bhakti Yoga can act as an inner buffer. Now what exactly is Bhakti Yoga? Bhakti means love, spiritual love, devotion. And Yoga is connection. So you could say Bhakti Yoga is the devotion connection. The devotion connection with what? With the Divine, with the Supreme, with the all attractive source of everything. So Bhakti Yoga provides us practices by which we can connect with the Divine. Bhakti Yoga has its wisdom and what we are discussing today is the preliminary part of Bhakti Yoga, wisdom and then the Bhakti Yoga practices. So what does Bhakti Yoga wisdom do for us? If we learn Bhakti Yoga, it can act as a buffer between us and all these three things. So these three are here, the world, the mind and the objects and we are here. So when Bhakti Yoga comes in between, what it means is, <coughs> if we habituate ourselves to some Bhakti practice such as say meditation, Kirtan or study of scripture, prayer, then by these practices, we can gain inner shelter. So earlier I talked about how the world will make us uncomfortable. Now, when the world makes us uncomfortable, there's this question that should we just accept it? Should we try to change it? Yeah. So, we have to find out that what are the things that are constructive and enjoyable. In our life, there are some activities which are enjoyable and destructive. But there are some activities which will be constructive and enjoyable. Say, for example, somebody likes music. And we have a lot of spiritual music available today. So whenever I feel bored, whenever I feel lonely, whenever I feel overworked, I tend to just watch TV or I tend to go on social media. Instead, let me keep some spiritual music readily accessible with me and let me go towards that. Some of us may like um, recitation of some prayers or you might have some good wisdom quotes that you like. So keep those with you. So based on your own nature, find out, okay, these are this list of constructive things and these are things which are enjoyable. Find out where the two intersect and make a list of at least one item, if possible three and keep that with you, keep the resources for that with you. By that what will happen? You will be able to have a means to deal with the discomfort. So when somebody feels uncomfortable, they feel just, okay, 
okay, let me just watch some movies. Okay, is there something else I can do? Oh, I can hear some good music. I have music not only provide, it also can provide the relief. So, we want escape, but we do not have to escape towards a destructive object. So, if we are, if we are thought beforehand and made this list and I kept it easily available, then it is then it's easier. So, we are now come to the second part. Topic was that why changing ourselves is so difficult? That is because of these three things and how we can make it easier. So, by making the resource of something which can be a healthy relief for us easily accessible. So, I think this is something which you can do yourself right now. We will have two minutes. You can take out your paper or phone or something and think of try to think of three activities which are constructive and enjoyable. They are constructive. There are some constructive activities which require discipline, which require austerity, which require willpower. But there are some constructive activities which we like to which we like to do also, they are enjoyable. So, as I said, it could be music, it could be reading some course, it could be reading, reading, some, reading a particular book which is attractive stories, whatever it is. So, at least list one point like that, if possible, write three, something that is constructive and enjoyable. And if you write one, try to see how you could also make it more easily accessible. If it is a music, maybe you can keep it in your phone, keep it in some other device, keep it, make a shortcut on your phone and keep it, keep a sticky reminder on your computer, put a sticky on your phone somewhere. Basically, list the activity and list how you could make it more easily accessible to yourself. Okay, maybe half a minute more. Okay, thank you. So, see uh, if you next time have this resource available you will find it easier to avoid going towards the destructive activity. The second point is that the mind is nature. So, what the bhakti wisdom tells us is that we are different from our mind and our mind is like a programmable device and say if you have a browser in your phone. Now, Mo have most of you heard of Bollywood? So, do you know also about Bollywood? Like India, we have Hollywood. So, India has its own big music industry, it is called Bollywood. So, say suppose somebody has repeatedly visited Bollywood.com hmm, and then they come for a spiritual program like this and then they hear about a spiritual book, say Bhagavad Gita. We have Bhagavad Gita over here, it is an ancient yoga text, several thousands year of years old. So, they hear about Bhagavad Gita and they want to go to, the, they go to their home and they would say, I want to know what is Bhagavad Gita. And they go open their browser and they type B. And what happens? Bollywood.com comes up. <laughs> so, that they did not intend to go to Bollywood, but because they had chosen it pa in the past repeatedly, that came as a autocomplete. So, similarly for us, our mind will give us certain autocompletes. And in fact, not only auto, so, there are some autocompletes, and in the browser, there is also something which is a home page. As soon as you click on the browser, it will open as a home page. So, 
Now, to understand what is the home page of our mind, the one way to know it is to ask ourselves, what do I think of when I have nothing to think of? When I have nothing specific to do, where do my thoughts go towards? That is the, that is the home page. So, now just because the home page is a particular website, we do not necessarily have to visit that site. So, what we could do is identify that, give it a name, give it a name. So, give it a name means that some of us may tend to worry too much. Now, you just go to your, say suppose you are working in a company and you go to your office and then your boss gives you a strange look. And you start thinking, oh, what happened? Why did I get that? Why did I get that look? Is my boss going to fire me? Or oh, there's a retrenchment if I'm fired. What will happen? I have taken mortgage for my house. How will I pay for it? If I can't pay for it, I'll be kicked out of the house. If I kick it out of the house, I'll be out in the cold and be unbearable. Now we might be in comfortable, cozy weather right now, but we will start shivering, <coughs> not because of the cold, but because of the stress. So, worry, what it does is, worry is like paying tax on loans you have not yet taken. So, what we need to do is, if our, if our mind has a tendency to start worrying, so what we do is, we identify it. Oh, this is the, this is the worry page that is opened. You use a browser metaphor. This is the worry page that has opened. This is the worry movie that has started. Or it could be, I was at a mental health conference in Connecticut last year, and there was one girl speaking. She she had, uh, or this was this this woman. She was a suicide intervention counselor, and he said that there was one girl who attempted suicide, and then she she called for help, and they they saved her. Then they asked her, why did you call? Why did you try to commit suicide? So, she was in a relationship with a boy and she called that boy and that boy did not pick up her phone. And because of that, she tried to kill herself. I said, this is ridiculous. Was how many times we call and people do not pick up the phone. But what happened? She always had fear of loneliness and abandonment. So, in her mind immediately movie started. Oh, he didn't pick up my phone. Probably he doesn't care for me. He doesn't care for me. Maybe he's with someone else already. Maybe he will abandon me. Oh, if he abandons me, in future, if I form a relationship with someone else, they will also abandon me. I'll be always lonely. All my friends will be in happy relationships, and I'll be lonely, and they will have pity on me. My whole life will be pitiable. What is the use of such a pitiable life? Better let me end my life. Now, if you look at this thread of thought, then you understand that it is not as unrealistic. It is stupid still, but from the emotional perspective, it is not stupid, it is understandable. So, if, if our mind tends to go off in a particular direction, we need to identify it first. Hey, that is a loneliness movie that has started. That is a loneliness program that has started. This loneliness page has opened up. So, each of us, whatever the default ways in which the mind tricks us, we need to identify that. Mm. <clears throat> I have this, when I am giving talks now, I give almost like 400 talks, 300 to 400 talks every year. I travel across the world. So, many times if I find that the audience is not responsive, then my mind starts a program. Nobody cares. And what happens? If I start feeling that nobody cares, then I also stop caring. And if I stop caring, if I am not thinking, if I am not presenting carefully, then, then truly the audience stops caring. So, it becomes a destructive loop. So, there and many times what has happened when this nobody cares, people are not interested, nobody is interested in spirituality, you are wasting your time. When the mind starts this program, what has happened is sometimes I still persevered and after that, although the audience does not seem to be responsive during the talk, but afterwards people come and ask questions or discuss. I see that many people really took some valuable points home. So, now, whenever that starts happening, I identify. 
This is the nobody cares program starting. People don't care program. People are not spiritually interested program starting. Well, yeah, not everybody is interested, but there are some people who are still very interested. So we need to identify those programs. So what happens if those programs you can identify, then we won't be carried away. And this understanding that we are different from our mind, it becomes easier if we try to practice meditation. Now we all do mantra meditation. We did the kirtan beforehand. We started this one. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Now when we do this meditation, the purpose of meditation is of course to absorb ourselves in that spiritual sound. But even if we can't absorb ourselves in that sound, still that meditation is beneficial. Why? Because we try to focus on that, on that mantra, but something within us takes our thoughts elsewhere. Hey, what about this assignment? Why did this person speak like this? Why is that I not got a reply to that message? What will I do if this happens? Hey, I don't want to think about this. Let me bring it back. So at the very least, meditation makes us aware that the mind is different from me. It's a very important point if we realize this, <coughs> that there is something within me that is different from me. So meditation, <coughs> we want to focus, but something within us takes our thoughts everywhere else. And in a sense, we all know this, there's something distracting within me. But our meditation practice, it can give us very strong reminders of that. And that is also very powerful awareness. Then when we start getting, when some movie starts off, say the loneliness movie starts off, the boredom movie starts off. Mm. The boredom movie can be very detrimental. You know, say you are sitting in a class and this class is boring. It starts off. Now as soon as you start thinking the class is boring, then we also become uninterested. And after that some joke happens and then sometimes when a joke happens, people start looking, what is the joke? What is the joke? Because what happens is when the class is going on, we go for a walk. Not physically but mentally we go for a walk. And then when a joke happens, hey, I also want a joke, what is it? We ask each other. In, <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Sure. Sure. So, you know, it is said, "He who uh, he who laughs last." What is the saying? Does anyone know? He who laughs last laughs the best. That's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it: He who laughs last didn't get the joke. <laughs> That's also possible. So, what happens is that our mind, once it starts, oh, this class is boring, then we don't even attempt to be interested. And then actually it becomes boring. So if that's the program, oh, class is boring. Then as soon as the, the class is boring, this is that program starting. It's like, okay, this, this is what the browser has opened up. I don't need to go on this page. I can open another tab. So as soon as we identify that this is not my thought, this is a tab which is opened up within me, I can choose whether to stay on this tab or go some other tab. So that's how spiritual knowledge can help us to identify which tab has opened up in our, in our browser. And by identifying it, we can choose whether I need to go in this direction or I don't need to go in this direction. And I'll do it. I'm going to conclude with the last point now. So the last point is that with respect to the gravity pull. Now this is very interesting that the gravity pull of the objects doesn't always stay the same. I mentioned that earlier also, but apart from the graph, sometimes it's going high up. But even that high also will not be permanent, especially if we start practicing spirituality. So if you start practicing bhakti yoga, doing mantra meditation, learning the practices of bhakti, then we start experiencing higher fulfillment. When we start experiencing higher fulfillment, then the same objects which seemed irresistible earlier, we find that, okay, there may be some pleasure, but no big deal. I can live without it. This is the biggest transformation that spirituality can do to us, that it can give us access to, to practices that will give us inner fulfillment. I'll give 
two examples to conclude this point that say suppose we are in we are in dark and we have just one candle and that candle also gives very flickering light because the wind is there and the candle is also very small now we may say that i and if somebody says just throw away that candle what so i would like see no throw away the candle no no i can't do that but suppose the power comes back in the room and it's, a, it's fully lit will we need the candle at that time no so for us the objects that seem very pleasurable irresistibly pleasurable they are like that candles when we are in the dark that candle is essential for us we feel if i don't have this what pleasure do i have i need this but when we start practicing spirituality our consciousness becomes illuminated like we start getting higher fulfillment we start getting something some inner sense of purpose and that is what makes the lure of these of the gravity pull lesser another point i'll conclude the another example is that see life is meant for a purpose bigger than pleasure what do i mean by this <clears throat> life is meant for a purpose bigger than pleasure if we consider that all of us uh, say if there's a small child now we have a child over here sometimes you know with relatives come or friends come <coughs> they may tickle the belly of the child now when the child is tickled what happens they start laughing now is laughter enjoyable yeah laughter is enjoyable but then if we all want to enjoy life now we could all buy our own perpetual tickling machines and be happy for the rest of our lives you know whenever we feel bored tickle tickle <laughs> <laughs> now or we could watch comedy for the rest of our life we could watch comedy now of course we may say i have to earn money i have to suppose you are wealthy enough so that you don't have to earn money you just said rest of your life watch comedy do you think it would be a very enjoyable life maybe for some few hours but after we want to get our teeth into something i want to do something so life is meant for something more than seeking pleasure what this bhakti yoga wisdom tells us is that happiness is best experienced as a by product not as a product happiness is best experienced not as a product okay i do this activity and this activity will produce happiness rather i do something meaningful in my life and when i do that meaningful thing happiness comes as a by product so all of us have been given certain abilities certain gifts certain interests certain opportunities certain responsibilities and all of these can help us to bring out our best if we start thinking pleasure is the purpose of our life soon we will be thwarted because there will be a lot of situations in our life when there will be no pleasure but that doesn't mean that is the end of our life if we look at our own lives who are the people who inspire us the most not in a fan sense like somebody some who are the people who inspire us the most they are people who are living for some purpose and they live for that purpose it means that they are not just seeking pleasure of course pleasure will come as a by product so if you are pursuing a career right now i, I just met a uh, one lady in stanford her daughter was there she was saying that she has changed her major 13 times till now one one year so she is she is in the first year and she is 31 now so why i i don't enjoy this i don't enjoy this i don't enjoy this so then i was telling her no, do you think that education is only for enjoyment do you think all the people throughout history till now <coughs> they enjoy the subjects that they taught sometimes a sub optimal purpose for life is better than no purpose sometimes i feel you know i want to find the perfect purpose for my life well who knows what that perfect purpose is just 
okay what is the best purpose that i can work for in my situation right now you can sub optimal okay you get your major and you have your life you discover afterwards you don't have to think that unless i find the best path in my life i won't move forward let me move forward with the best in my situation and i can do course correction and this is where spirituality gives us understanding that there is a higher plan to our life there is a higher purpose to our life that each one of us is a part of a whole and what we are is a gift of the divine to us and what we become is our gift to the divine what we are is the divine's gift to us so whatever interests whatever talents whatever whatever uh, inclinations we have this is what we have been gifted with and there are we may have some other gifts also we don't know about some people say i have many hidden talents the problem is they are hidden even from me <laughs> okay they may be there let's see what you have right now. what is your interest what is your obligation what is your situation right now there is a plan for our lives so we start doing the best we can in our situation and once we start doing that we start doing our best in our situation with spiritual understanding understanding there is a higher purpose to life there is a plan and to the extent we do the second thing we practice our spirituality we do some meditation connect ourselves with bhakti wisdom we will find that we will get more and more clarity and as we start applying ourselves purposefully to create a meaningful life to do something meaningful in our life then the lure of the destructive behavior will go down so we can't say don't say i'll not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this that is useless what happens and i say i'll not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this we say that and the mind will come with a eraser and erase the not i'll not do this i'll not do this i'll not do this i'll do this it come like that so don't focus on what you will not do focus on what you will do so look at the present situation you are in see that okay for whatever way this present situation has come up there is a higher plan to your life and if you spend some quality time connecting with the divine through devotional practices that will give you the inner calm and clarity and then instead of seeking pleasure seek a purpose even if it is some optimal purpose seek that purpose work according to it and once you start working according once we start seeing that i can do something constructive in my life i can make a difference in my life i can make a difference in someone else's life a positive difference then the pull of the destructive behavior will start going down so ultimately the way to give up destructive behavior is to take up a constructive purpose with spiritual understanding and once we start doing that that will become the adventure of our life <coughs> sometimes we may feel that oh you know i am i am such a situation that i am powerless i have no choices everything is forced for me i am completely helpless there is nothing i can do in this situation i am completely trapped have any of you felt like this any time i am trapped in this situation has any of you felt like that yeah now when you when you say that okay i am trapped i am helpless in this situation just ask yourself a simple question can i this is a terrible situation can i make it worse what what do you mean who wants to make it worse no no you don't have to make it but i'm simply ask can i make it worse no matter how bad a situation is we can always make it worse i might have a fracture and i might be bedridden but i can take a hammer and crack my other knee also isn't it so no matter how bad a situation is we can always make it worse and that means we are not as powerless as we think if we can make the situation worse then we can make it better so we start with what is the best i can do in this situation if we start doing that one thing we fix one thing we fix one thing we fix start doing one constructive thing in your life and you'll find that will begin a chain reaction and more and more life will become filled with constructive of actions multiplying in your life and there is sometimes we feel our destructive behavior is a very great force which is pulling me down that's true 
but there is a higher power ready to help us. There is the divine who is ready to help us if we take up the responsibility to help ourselves. And the more we start doing constructive things in our life, there is a cyclic effect and we will become <coughs> filled with positive energy and the destructive behaviors will gradually fall away from us. So, I will summarize. I spoke today on the topic of inner change, why changing ourselves is so difficult and how we can make it easier. <coughs> First talked about how all of us have a desire to change and become a better human being, better student, better professional, <coughs> better family member. But we make a resolve to change ourselves and we change ourselves. But while the new we is not looking, the old me seems to come back and we lose heart over a period of time. And we instead of saying that this is simply a, I do not have willpower or determination, even addiction requires determination, it is just misdirected determination. So, we all have determination. We need to understand a little better. So, I talked about three factors that make destructive behavior so almost irresistible. The first was, what was it? The world's, the world's discomfort. When, whenever we feel uncomfortable because of loneliness, boredom, uh, anxiety, overwork, stress, uh, that time we gravitate towards some behavior. It is not because that behavior is so attractive, but because we need relief. So, at that time, instead of simply beating ourselves up, we try to see, okay, this is not going to be, a, this discomfort is not unnatural and it is not going to be permanent. It is like a wave which is rising, it will go down. It is like an arm wrestling match, it is a timed arm wrestling match. The discomfort will stay for some time, it will go away. Next round will be from neutral ground, not from that same point. Then the second point was what? The mind, mind is deception. What does the mind do? It shows us the pleasure, but not the price. Say, we drink and we get a hangover, but next time, when the opportunity to drink comes, we only remember the high, not the hangover. So, this way, the mind deceives us. And also, this is another way, it makes us do wrong, and then it beats us up for doing wrong. Like a friend who tempts us to rob a bank, and then judges us for robbing the bank. So, what do we do for dealing with the mind? We <coughs> learn to distance ourselves from the mind. We write down the prizes. We create reminders of the price so that the pleasure won't deceive us. The third was what? Sense objects have a gravity pull. And depending on how much we have indulged in, the gravity pull becomes stronger and stronger. So, somebody who's never taken drugs, they may pass by a joint without even noticing it. Somebody is repeatedly taken, we pull forcefully. <coughs> so, to so, we need to understand, be understanding, not think that we are simply weak willed and beat ourselves up. That the gravity pull is very strong for me. So, what do I do? I create a distance. It, I talked about in Google how the, just by covering the lids of the candies, the sweet consumption decreased. So, the distance can be the physical or it can be simply an obstacle between us and that object. And the urges come, if we just, and the, the urges do not last for very long. So, if we have a, some obstacle, and the urge will come and go and will not succumb. Then I talked about the power of bhakti, this is the last part of the class. What does the power of bhakti do? Firstly, it with respect to the world's discomfort, it gives us, a, it gives us an inner buffer. But it can provide us activities which are both comfortable, both constructive and enjoyable. So, often for enjoyable activities, we go to a destructive activity. So, we, we did a listing of constructive and enjoyable activities and see how we can make them more accessible to us. So, I, whenever I feel bored, I just want to waste time in social media. Okay, but let me see, I can hear some spiritual music. Keep it ready with you. And the second was with respect to the mind, our meditation practice, even if we do not get absorbed in meditation, meditation can make us aware that the mind is different from us. Something within me take, keeps taking me away from where I want to go. And once we understand that this mind is different from me, then we can identify its typical programs. The loneliness program can make a person suicidal just because of one unanswered, unanswered phone call. The, the worry program or the worry tab can show a movie that begins just because a strange glance, strange look from the boss, I will be out in the cold. So, we identify our typical programs and then as soon as it starts off, okay, this is the tab that has opened up. This is the default tab, auto completed tab or even the home tab. 
that is there for me. So, I will identify it, I can say I do not want to watch this, I can watch something else. And the third was that the gravity pull of the objects, that they stay attractive as long as we do not have some higher pleasure. So, I said the Bhakti Yoga connects us with the all attractive divi divine and gives us higher pleasure. And secondly, pleasure is too cheap a purpose for life. Mm, life is meant for something bigger than pleasure. Pleasure is best experienced not as a product, but as a byproduct. Because we may all, we can all get a perpetual tickling machine or get a perennial comedy show channel, but we won't be happy watching that. We want something more in life. So what we want is a life of purpose, meaning, contribution. So what we are is the divine's gift to us. What we become is our gift to the divine. If we turn, if we look at what my situation is, and let me do the best that I can in this situation. Understand that there is a higher plan to my life. And let me do my best. As we start adding constructive activities in our life, as we start making a difference in our lives and the lives of others, then the lure of destructive activities will start automatically going away. And <coughs> I concluded by talking that when uh, we want to <coughs> make this change, there is a higher power waiting to assist us. If we just start the change right now, if we feel that I am completely helpless, I can do nothing, then we can ask ourselves the con contrary to question, can I make things worse? If I can, that means I am not powerless, I can make things better also. So if we start living a purposeful life in a mood of, with, with spiritual understanding, we can slowly move to, slowly but surely move towards a constructive life, free from destructive activities. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, any questions or comments? I really like that talk. Thank you. Thank you. What did you like? Anything specific? Um, one of the, something specifically that I liked was in the mind deception part when he mentioned that like our mind will be the one to convince us to do something and then also judge us for it. Yeah. Like, oftentimes, I'll think of myself as the person who convinced me to do it. Um, and like, I'll, I'll judge myself. Once you create that like distinction be through meditation of be that you're not your thoughts, then that really helps. Hmm. Yeah, there is a time to evaluate also, but our evaluation should encourage us, not discourage us. So, see, there is say I am here, the destructive behavior is here. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I am here. This constructive behavior is here, I am here, the destructive behavior is here. Mm. So, our evaluation should stop us from doing the destructive behavior. But sometimes our evaluation makes us so discouraged that we feel I cannot do the constructive behavior. So, then that is where the mind is, mind is cheating us. So, there is conscience and there is pseudo conscience. The conscience stops us from doing wrong, but pseudo conscience makes us feel so bad about ourselves that we think I can never do anything good and that is why it is bad. So, this is if I say that I am here, the, the, the my the conscience, the self evaluation should come here where it stops me from destructive behavior, but if it comes here between me and constructive behavior, then that is the mind judgmentality, it is pseudo conscience. So, we do need to evaluate and learn, but in a way that encourages us to do the right thing, not discourages us from doing the right thing, thinking I am hopeless. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mm, I was listening to the talk about the bottom fish about the Yes, exactly. <coughs> yes, exactly. So many of you may have this experience also. Thank you for Param sharing that quote from the Gita, Param Dishtanivarti. That suppose you, if you tend to get distracted by social media or whatever, but if you are doing something important, like you said, when you have deadline and you start doing the work, and not only are you able to do it without distraction, without discouragement, without disheartenment, but also you feel satisfied by that. Mm -hmm. So now, what is important for us is that sometimes deadlines create that purpose for us, that urgency for us. But the challenge is that there are certain activities which are important for us 
but they don't come with deadlines. Relationships are like that. Our spirituality is like that. Our setting care of our health, our self-development is like that. So if we are only deadline driven, we will do the activities which we have to do, but the other activities we will never do. That's why that the deadline driven, our deadline driven actions can convince us that we have the capacity to absorb ourselves. And then we can extend that using our intelligence to other activities which don't come with inbuilt deadlines. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Or comments? Yes, please. Okay. It's an excellent question. How can we accept a suboptimal purpose while knowing that we are designed for a higher purpose? See, when we say we are designed for a higher purpose, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are like programmed machines. That this is what we have to do. Every one of us has free will. And free will means that it's reciprocal. It's we make a choice. And then there's a reciprocation on that. And rather than thinking of uh, our higher purpose to be like one path, we can think of it as one direction. Mm. And in that direction, there can be many different paths. So, say if uh, now all of us can broadly understand the difference between a constructive activity and a destructive activity. Now, we could have difference between constructive activity, more constructive activity and most constructive activity. That is the difference between say a suboptimal purpose and optimal purpose. So say if we have come to a crossroad and should I go this way or this way or this way? I am not sure. If I stay over there itself, I am not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Generally, if we overthink things, we just make ourselves miserable. Like some people they say, I was confused earlier, now I am not so sure. <laughs> what has happened? <laughs> it is the same thing. We overthink and we make ourselves. So even if I if this is not the right way, if sub, if I have these three paths, okay, I go along this way. Then eventually, even if I find out it's the wrong way, I can always do course correction. But if I am here, I stay stuck. So life never comes with the guarantee of right decisions. Hmm. Sometimes we make the right decisions and sometimes we make the decisions right. Okay, I made the decision, but how can I make the best out of it? If we start waiting for the right decision, how long will we keep waiting? How will we even know that the decision was right? What we can instead do is try to develop the right decision making process. By right, I mean the best in our situation. Okay, with my knowledge, with my understanding, with my experience, this path seems to be the best. And I move forward. Sometimes life will show that it was the right path. Sometimes it will show it was not the right path. Okay, what went wrong? Okay, I didn't think I didn't think of this factor. Okay, I learn. I do course correction. We do course correction. So ultimately, all that we can do is refine our decision making process. And especially if we develop our spiritual compass you could say we develop our spirituality that will also give us an inner compass that will help us to make the decision process better but ultimately if we have made the best developed a good decision making process if we make a wrong decision we will realize it faster <coughs> so you could say that i'll conclude this answer with, with, with the example of google maps <coughs> that suppose we take a wrong turn Say Google, we are going along a road and Google says turn right and we turn left. Now what does GPS do at that time? Recalculate. Sorry? Recalculate. Recalculates. Does GPS say, you didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> GPS never says that. So similarly, the higher plan that is there for our lives, it's not that one mistake is going to disrupt that plan. We could say we are, that's why I said it's more like a direction with a network of paths. So if we broadly understand that this is a destructive activity, I should not do this, this is a constructive activity. Start doing that. And if you spend some time for our 
spiritual growth and things will become clearer what happens is that for uh, all of us we can say if there are 15 activities i'm doing in my life right now hmm? there are three which are very bad i should stop them there are three which are very good i should do them the remaining nine some of them are good some of them are bad some of them i don't know if they are good or bad okay so like that we could say when we have to make a choice in our life let's focus right now on doing what we know is constructive and avoiding that which we know is destructive and that which is in the gray zone okay we are not sure so do whatever makes sense at that time but what happens is there is no need to think that because there is something in the gray zone the whole everything is gray is this difference am i making myself clear there are surely for all of us some activities which are white and some activities which are black and there may be many gray but because of the gray we shouldn't have to put the grain color on everything and become indecisive about everything that which is the white and that which is the black let's do and not do those things and as we keep doing those things <coughs> we will also develop inner clarity we will also grow spiritually and as we grow spiritually the gray zone will start becoming lesser and lesser or even if the gray zone remains we will we will get a better sense of how to deal with that gray zones so a sub optimal purpose is is better than a uh, a sub optimal purpose can fit the, fit within a higher plan because the higher plan doesn't treat us like a program device the higher plan treats us like a conscious being who will also learn and go by experience does that answer your question good question thank you okay that's a good point if it is a suboptimal path or suboptimal purpose yeah i think what you're saying is valid point i'm talking more about suboptimal path mm, okay um, the way i was using it is that there is something which we need to do right now now is that the best thing that i can do right now it may not be the absolute best but this is the best i can do in this situation the what i am doing right now may not be the absolute best but it is the best i can do in this situation so yeah i agree with your point that if i am going to use the word purpose uh, we could say purpose will remain the same but what if i don't know the purpose right now then let me take the path which is i am following right now and gradually my purpose